And turn up that uh, bit in Mark's Gospel again for me, uh, if you would. We'll go through together. Um, I'll just show you this while you do that. Um, these are small, um, I think, what are they, what are they called? Custard? They called custard donuts. Custard, custard slices. Um, they're very. They've been. It's been chopped very small. And you know how fond I am of sometimes um, using props uh, in order to try and make a point. Um, well, I'm going to be referring to those in in a short while, and I thought I'd better explain it to you because you you'll just spend the first few minutes wondering what on earth it is that I'm doing. So custard slices. Anybody like custard slices? There's a, there's one left in the fridge, so you can. Well, it's just Peter at the moment, so you can fight Peter for it if you are uh, after. See me after Peter, and you can have the bit that that came from, the proper bit. That's not bad, is it? So you came, you weren't expecting that when you came this morning, were you? Fantastic. Okay, so Mark chapter 12, where we were looking. Um, question for you first. How many of you have taken uh, out insur- ever, ever taken out insurance, not because you, you had to, but because you chose to? So I'm not talking here about the compulsory insurance like car insurance. It is compulsory. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, when you, could, you have a choice. You know, am I going to take the insurance out or not? You know what I mean? So maybe mobile phone insurance. Yeah, some of you might have taken out a bit of mobile phone insurance. Um, maybe home insurance. Some of us might do that. Um, PPI. That's a, ooh. PPI, some people take that out, don't they? Um, if you have, I wonder if you ever thought about, about it like this. If you have, you, you're buying an experience, really, aren't you? Um, the experience of having someone at the end of a phone, um, when it all goes wrong, and that which you feared happens, that's able to say to you, ah, oh, don't worry. Don't worry about that. We'll take care of it. Um, and it's that sense of that experience that drives us to, to buy that insurance, isn't it? And I must admit, I'm a bit of an insurance uh, person. I do like uh, that idea, and I do tend to buy into insurance. This is not an advert for insurance, by the way, uh, this morning. Um, but it is an illustration of how, sooner or later in life, we all come to the point where we know we feel weak and exposed And our own resourcefulness isn't actually going to cut it. It's not going to be enough. And whether it's something trivial, relatively, or whether it's something more serious, what a relief when that happens and someone is able to say to us, I'll take it from here. I'll take care of that. And it's a great delight, actually, isn't it? We could call it the delight the peace that comes from that. And that, I think, is the feeling that came over the people in today's story in verse 37 of chapter 12, if you've got it there in front of you. Do you see what it says there? The large crowd listened to Jesus with delight as it dawned on them that they were listening to to someone who claimed to be able to take care of absolutely everything. The one who says, I'll take it from here. I'll take it from here. And so as we pick up this story, uh, which we're going to do now from verse 35, I just want to just briefly rewind and remind you that up to this point, Jesus has faced a barrage of questions, um, challenging his authority. Maybe there are questioners among us here this morning. Um, It's not wrong to come with questions, is it, to the Bible or to the Lord of the Bible. Um, And many people today continue to question these eyewitness accounts of Jesus, not from a genuine spirit of inquiry, an open-minded spirit of inquiry, but from a resentment of Jesus' authority. And that's what was going on with the people that were questioning Jesus up to this point. And then in verse 34, we read, From then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. So the questioning from others of Jesus' authority has come to an end. And from verse 35, Jesus is no longer answering the questions. I want you to notice here that Jesus is the one asking the questions he's not answering anymore he's asking look at verse 35 as it begins while jesus was teaching in the temple courts he asked how is it that the teachers of the law 
say that the Christ is the son of David. David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. Now, me scratching your heads, uh, perhaps, and saying, well, what's all that about? What's all, what, what have I just read? What's all, all that about? Well, in a nutshell, Jesus tells the people who are listening, I wonder if you're listening this morning, Jesus tells those who are listening to him, your sense of me is too small. Your sense of who I am is too small. When he begins, how is it that the teachers of the law say that the Christ is the son of David? What he's saying is, hang on a minute. Have you Just think about this for a moment. And then he's going to go on to say what he wants you to think about. I know it's warm today. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but I'm going to ask you... I'm going to ask you to think a little bit now for a minute, all right? We're going to go to another part in the Bible in order to do this. But are you, are you ready to think? Because Jesus says to the people that are listening, I want you to think about something for a minute. He says, how is it that the teachers of the law say that the Christ is the son of David? And in one sense, there's nothing wrong with anybody saying that the Christ is the son of David. We need to get that clear first of all, okay? Um, the Christ is the son of David. It's what we sing at Christmas time. You know, the, the, the Christmas songs that go like, um, um, uh, to you in David's town this day is born of David's line. Yeah, finish that off. A saviour who is Christ the Lord and this will be the sign. To you is born in David's um, a town this day, born of David's line. Or once in royal David's city. The emphasis is on, 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 the, on the King David. And in Matthew chapter 1, the, the, do you remember the, the genealogy that traces Jesus' ancestry back to King David? Um, so, so we can see that's, that's important. And by now the people were realizing that Jesus is that son of David. That's the other thing we need to notice here. He is that forever king. So when Jesus, when Jesus asks Peter, do you remember that famous bit in Mark's gospel? Jesus asks Peter, who do you say I am? And what does Peter reply? He says, you are the Christ. Um, and then blind Bartimaeus, which we had a few weeks ago, do you remember him? He cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. So that the crowds were beginning to realize that the Jesus in front of them was this son of David, this Christ. Which means they were beginning to recognize Jesus was as great a figure of authority as the son of David is described in, in the Bible. And I'm not going to ask you to turn this up because I'm going to ask you to turn up another passage instead. But this is how, this is how the son of David was described in 2 Samuel, for example. Listen to how high and exalted a view of Jesus this is. This is what people were beginning to understand. Jesus in front of them was this kind of person. In 2 Samuel 7, we read this. The Lord declares to you, um, this is speaking to David, the king. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body son of David, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Okay, he's going to be a, for a king of a forever kingdom. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And when he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. And haven't we heard already Jesus talking about what's going to happen to him? I'm going to be flogged. And of course, not for his own sins, but for our sins. And it carries on, but my love will never be taken away from him. And as I took it, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. 
So folks, this was a really high and exalted view that people had of Jesus as they, thought, as they saw him as the son of David, as the Christ. But Jesus says to them, you know, it's greater than that. It's greater than that. And we ought to be thinking, well, what could be greater than that? And Jesus says in verse 36, he says, look at Psalm 110. Look at Psalm 110 is what he tells them to do. And I'm going to ask you to do that. Can you turn in your Bibles with me to see what Jesus means? He says to them, look at Psalm 110. Psalms are in the middle of your Bibles. If you've got a church Bible, this is on page 431. Psalm 110. Page 431. So here's a psalm we're told is of David. It's written by David. And David says this. King David is looking forward to that forever king that we've just been reading about who would be one of his descendants. And David called him Lord. Look at it. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord God, that is, the Lord God says to my Lord... That's, that's the forever king that's going to come from him. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David's describing a, a cosmic scene here where, where God the Father speaks to the Christ, the forever king. And he says to this Christ, this forever king, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Until I put them under your feet in that position of humility and utter defeat, that your enemies, as it were, serve as kind of furniture to rest your feet on. And then it goes on in verses 2 to 3. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. Picture of the scepter, the, 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 the emblem of, the, of a ruler, the king. And, and you will rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy majesty. From the womb of the dawn you will receive the dew of your youth. There's a picture here of, of this great and exalted Christ who has enemies, but he's also got people on his side too, called in their willing troops, people who are willing to be with him and on his side. And I want you to notice, what Jesus wants you to notice is that David calls that son, that forever king, he calls him Lord. Lord. Now, we don't use that name very much. It doesn't perhaps mean very much to us. Lord Vader or something like that doesn't have the same ring about it. But we've got to remember that everyone knew that there is only one Lord. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And King David knew that. There's only one Lord, and that Lord is God. So by calling Jesus Lord, David in this psalm is telling us that Jesus, or this Christ when he comes, will be God himself. I just want us to pause there and think about this. Because Jesus is saying, they, they, didn't, they didn't see this, and you just need to see it and think about it for a minute. The one standing in front of them with a face and with hands and legs and feet and eyes and the rest of it, or the one who steps off these pages of Mark's Gospel to you and me right now is none other than the almighty <laughs> creator and sustainer of the universe. And, do you know, I think sometimes we forget that as we read through Mark's Gospels. He is standing before them and he's saying... God, God. And you, know, you may have heard many people say, well, Jesus never said that he was God. <laughs> well, excuse me, but what is he actually drawing their attention to here? Now, as we think of applying that, how do we apply that into our lives? As we pause and, and we think about what Jesus is saying, um, I want to say to us, we, a lot of us will say, well, I know that. I, I, I know Jesus is, is God. I, I, I can recite... John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, we do that at Christmas time, I remember all that. But 
I reckon I need to hear this because functionally I don't live it. And, and, I, and if I don't live it, I reckon you don't live it either. Um, when Jesus is small in my expectations of him, and um, when my goals are so small, and in my life my ego is the thing that's big, and my fears are really big, and I forget that the one I read about here is God himself, the one who steps off the pages of this gospel and says all that he says. The Jesus I put my faith in is the, the one Lord, the living God. And he will defeat my enemies effortlessly. And if you're a believer, he will defeat your enemies effortlessly too. And that ought to be a cause of great delight and joy to you. Jesus is the one who says, I can take it from here. Whatever that might be that, that, is, that is pressing in on you, I can take it from here. He's got that much authority. You've got troubles and you're following him. Really? You've got troubles? I can take it from here, he says this morning. You belong to a church that looks weak, feels weak, insignificant, substandard. I think it's all just going to go down the pan. Really? Really? Jesus said, I can take it from here. I can take it from here. You want something in your heart and, and you, maybe you're praying about it and he's not answered and it just feels so hopeless. Hopeless? Really? Really? Jesus says, I can take it from here. That's his authority. You've done something you're ashamed of and, 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 and you feel shamed and it's difficult to, to be near God's people or come back to church and so on. Really? Really? Jesus says, I can take it from here. And maybe you're, you're, you're agonizing over a choice in life. Should I go this way? Should I go that way? You know, what's important? It's all going to make all the difference. The choice that I make, I've got to make the right decision. I feel like I'm navigating blind. I don't... Really? Really? What, who's important here? What's the important thing here? I can take it from here, he says. And how many of us aren't, one time or another, paralyzed with fear? Fear about health, fear about our loved ones. Fear about the job, something that's going on in the future. Fear about almost anything, really. How much of our lives are controlled by fear? And Jesus says, I can take it from here. I, I, I think we just need to pause and say, can you see, knowing Jesus like this, as he's wanting them to know him, just changes everything. And it's a cause of delight. It should be a cause of delight to us this morning. That this is how Jesus makes himself known to them. Their view was very, very small. And he says, no, you need to look again. Look again and see who I am. And in verses 38 to 40, well, 38 to 44, in fact, the whole section that we finished uh, with in our reading, we've got a window into how Jesus, or actually how God puts Jesus' enemies under his feet. Of course, that's the bit in Psalm 110 that Jesus seems to draw their attention to. Did you notice how Jesus is this king whose enemies are effortlessly being put under his feet? He doesn't even have to fight for it. God puts his enemies under his feet. That's the bit that Jesus seems to be drawing our attention to and so what he does in 38 to 44 is like a kind of it's like a kind of peeling back a little look he shows us a peek at what's really happening in the world right now right now this moment i don't know if any of you watch uh, watch the crown uh, elaine and i watched the crown that episode that, that, that series of um episodes and there was one where the private the, the the queen's private secretary you get to find out that one of his hobbies is um, uh, like uh, reenacting battles, historic battles, and he has like obviously miniature figures, and he arranges them in order to reenact these battles, um, be, like the same thing you might do with a train set or something like that. Okay, um, so a battle, and what we get is, it, it, as it were, we get a view of that of the battle that's happening right now, here and now, in this room and beyond. In these verses, 38 to 44, opened up for us. Um, we get the kind of view from a heavenly viewpoint. And this is Psalm 110 stuff. Psalm 110 is very warrior-like with this king who rules in the midst of his enemies and he's got troops on his side and he defeats his enemies. 
Um, and that's, that's the picture that we see in these verses in 38 to 44. Um, the first section, 38 to 40, about the scribes who we've met before as Jesus' enemies, they, give us the, the, they show us the enemies that God is putting under Christ's feet to be his footstool. This is what's going on now as God puts his enemies under Christ's feet to be his footstool. And the first thing Jesus says is that it's all about the heart, you know. Do you know, this battle that's raging in this room and beyond, right now, here and now, is all about the heart, he says. Look at verse 38, how he begins. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. So how he introduces the battle here. That's not watch out because they might be hiding, you know, behind a, a doorway and they might jump out and grab. It's that, not that kind of watch out. When he says watch out for the teachers of the law, he means... Be careful that you don't have a heart like them. I don't think any of us, I don't think any of them were in danger then of being scribes. I don't think any of us are in danger of being the scribes, but we are in danger of having a heart like them. And Jesus says, watch out that you don't have a heart like this lot. This is the enemies that he's putting under his feet. So what does he, how does he, what is, how does he describe them? What are they doing? Let's have a look in verse 38. Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and places of honour at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished severely. Five things quickly that they do. They wore these long white robes. Yep, these kind of religiously looking long white robes where everybody else had sort of colourful clothes on. Um, and when you see somebody like that, they stand out. I don't know if you ever... I, I was at um, Speak Hall uh, on the day that you were there, Peter, recently. And there were a couple of guys there uh, on that day, you nodding, you probably saw them. And they, do, they just stood out. Um, uh, they were wearing the, 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 the long white garb or whatever. And this is what the, Jesus is talking about here. Um, walking around in flowing robes. Um, they liked to wear those. They made them noticeable. Their, their image gave them status. For them, image, it's all about status, what they wore, how they looked, how they presented themselves. Um, they, looked, they looked to showy things to give them status among people. And that mattered to them. They want a status among people by the things that they have or the things that they wear or the things that belong to them. The second thing we notice about them, they like it when people greeted them and made them feel important. They liked it even more if important people singled them out and invited them to somewhere. And if that had happened, they would make sure that everybody heard about it. Woe betides anyone who didn't greet this person as they expected to be greeted, because they expected it. And that's how you did, that's, that's how it was. They liked the most important seats in the synagogue. The most important seats in the synagogue were the places reserved for those who were allowed to speak in the synagogue. They liked those seats because, of course, they had something to say, of course, didn't they? They liked to be thought of as experts on some topic or other. And what they had to say gives them status among people. Even if they said nothing, you'd better give them your attention or else. And they liked places of honour at banquets. If there was something going on, you'd better be sure that they were invited. And not just invited, you'd better be sure they got the honour and the respect that they thought that they deserved. And then he said they devour widows' houses. What's all that about? Well, not, people aren't entirely clear what that's all about. But, prop, okay. Um, uh, what does it look like to devour something? You just feel the word for a minute. To devour. If I was to devour that, what would I do? Have a little nibble around the outside? I'd devour it, wouldn't I? It'd be completely devoured. That's it, isn't it? I've got to finish for a moment. You've got to wait for me to finish for a moment. But that's devouring, isn't it? They're not devouring cream cakes. They're devouring widows' houses. That's shocking, isn't it? Isn't that terrible? Um... We don't know what it's about exactly, but clearly they're preying on the vulnerable, taking advantage. Um, the scribes didn't have any income, so they depended on people's generosity. So they seem to be um, yeah, bleeding people dry, as it were. 
um, getting from them, taking it, it, to the extent of taking away even the houses of the most vulnerable in that way. And I don't know, do you see that there's a sense in which they didn't even notice that? It kind of just pops up there. Oh, oh, and they devour widows' houses. I reckon they didn't even realize they were doing it. Um, as they, they greedily tried to race to the top of the ladder and, you know, that court, people below just get devastated. Houses get taken away or whatever it might be. I guess we might think of it in how in our materialistic culture, because we do live in a materialistic culture, don't we? And our drive to get more and more and more for less and less and less. I mean, well, I mean, what about the lives of the people who serve that kind of uh, culture, that way of living? Probably people living in underdeveloped countries that serve that way of life. I wonder if it can be said of, of them that their houses, their lives are taken away from them, as it were, for the benefit of um, others. Uh, getting more and more and more and having more and more and more. Um, and he also says, for a show they make lengthy prayers. There's nothing wrong, of course, with lengthy prayers, but what's wrong is he says it's for a show. Um, so this is obviously, this is religious hypocrisy he's pointing out here. These people were outwardly religious. You would have seen them in church on Sunday, but they were inwardly rebellious. And what's worrying is that they, they, they couldn't even see it, or, or they wouldn't see it. They refused to see it. So what do we, what, as we come to the end of that, do we, say, we have a picture of a world where what matters most is the here and now, really, isn't it, among these people? Where honour and prestige are prized, and status, and having things that give status, where being somebody counts, where having things count, where, it's, where my rights are really important and my rights are paramount. If you and I could spend a week in the home of someone like this, what would you expect to find, do you think? What would it be like to spend a week with this kind of person? How much happiness? How much peace? How much love? What would the conversation be about, do you think? How much harmony would there be? What would their relationships with their neighbours, with other people, be like, do you think? Well, I think it's a world not much unlike our own. And it's a world not unlike the one we inhabit in our own hearts, if we care to admit it to ourselves, I think. And it's a world where the enemies of God, uh, it's a world of the enemies of God's forever king, and as Psalm 110 says, one day it will be over. As bit by bit, effortlessly, it becomes the footstool for the Lord Jesus. And it is effortless, isn't it? I mean, how much effort does it take to live like this? To live mainly for the here and now, for things, for status, for respect, for the honour of people. How much effort does that take, really? In the heart? It doesn't take any effort at all. It's exactly where my heart goes or wants to go. But as we finish up, while God is effortlessly putting enemies under King Jesus' feet in that section there, he's also effortlessly building willing troops and followers of this king. And I want us to look again at the earthly battle raging, but this time, look at the winners. And there, this is, this, well, look at the winner, who is an example of the winners. Verse 41 to the end. It's a beautiful picture. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put into the treasury more than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. Picture the scene. Quickly, inside the, the part of the temple that was known as the Court of Women were a line of 13 or so really large chests, oversized piggy banks. And they were called chauffeur chests. 
and each one was for a specific a particular offering. So uh, the temple tax would be one, or uh, bird offerings, separate offerings for things like the wood and the incense and the gold that were, were required to keep the temple and its decorations and so on. And then another six chests to hold the free will offerings that people brought and so on. And the money went into these chests via these kind of large trumpet-shaped horns, which with, with a narrow end facing upwards to prevent people from, you know, from theft, really, uh, getting wider at the bottom and then into these chests. And when the rich bring their offerings, you can imagine, you can hear the noise from all the coins as they echo against the copper and the chests and so on. And people would gather around, this would be a bit of a scene, this kind of thing going on. What's going on here? What does Jesus notice? notice? He says, he sees a poor, a poor widow came. And we've already heard about a wid- widows, haven't we? We've already heard that um, Jesus' enemies devour widows' houses. And this widow is poor, so perhaps that's exactly what's happened to her. Um, if it was, she'd have reason to be really bitter and cross and about her circumstances and everything, wouldn't she? Why would she even be there? But what is she doing in the midst of the enemy, as it were, using the language of Psalm 110? You see what she's doing? She throws two small copper coins into the treasury. They didn't have small denomination coins like we have today. The smallest is a penny now, isn't it? It used to be a half P when I was growing up. The smallest value coin was called a lepta. That's what it's talking about here. And it was worth approximately a pound in today's money. So that's what the woman puts in. She puts in two lepta, two coins of about a pound each. So she puts in effectively two pounds. And as Jesus pointed out, verse 44, what is most significant about this is not that it was two pounds, but that it was everything she had. It was everything she had. It was all she had to live on, Jesus said. In other words, having put that in, she had nothing left, not even for her next meal, if it was all that she had. I would never do that. I would never do that. Can you ever imagine being in a position of doing that? And isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that we got this little detail that there were two coins? I mean, I would never do that anyway, but there were two coins. Why, why didn't she put in one and keep the other? Because all she ever had was split. At least it was split into two coins. She could have done that. But she put both of the coins in. Wow. How is she doing that? It doesn't make sense. How is she doing it? What is going on in this widow's heart? Surely something out of this world, something supernatural, is going on in this widow's heart. What was she thinking? I'll tell you one thing she would have known, that the temple was a place where sacrifice was made for sin. And by throwing everything in, we get to see into this widow's heart. She, she knew she was a sinner. The temple was a place where her sin was dealt with. A way in which she could be right with God through sacrifice, and, and that meant all the world to her, more than anything else in the whole world. And she threw in her two coins. And as she does that, what do you know? But she is doing what we've seen and said over many weeks. She's doing the impossible. You notice? I mean, it seems impossible. She's doing the impossible. She's giving up everything to follow giving up everything to follow. And what do you know? Losing her life, she's gaining it too. And I don't just mean gaining it for eternity. I mean she's gaining it in the present, in the here and now. Because just as I asked you to do before with the last lot, let me ask you to imagine just spending a week with someone like this. Can you imagine it? Oh, spend a week with someone like this. What would you expect to find? How much happiness? How much happiness? How much peace? How much love? What would the conversation be about with her, do you think? Can you imagine? How much harmony would there be in her life? What would her relationship with other people be like? Can you imagine? 
No, folks, this widow is not someone to be pitied. She's someone to be envied. She's someone to be envied. I'm going to finish. Let me wrap up with some final thoughts about how we apply all this. Jesus is Lord. That was at the beginning. Lord God. And rather than running from that like worried sheep this morning, which we do because we are like sheep, let's just hear it with pleasure, guys. Hear it with pleasure like the crowd did. Imagine all that is good about that fact this morning. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Whatever it is for you, he's the one who says, I can take care of that. I will take care of that. That's wonderful. It's worth a smile. Some of you have smiled this morning. That's wonderful. But be under no illusion. Jesus is the conquering warrior king of Psalm 110 as well. You know, he doesn't come reeking of hand cream like a lot of people's vi- visions of Jesus. He is the warrior king of Psalm 110 too, whose enemies his father is effortlessly putting under his feet. And so when King Je- the king of kings and the lord of lords says to you, the time has come, the kingdom is near, repent and believe the good news, it's not an invitation, it's a command from the king. The king commands you. And when he says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, give up everything. He meant it. He meant it. And he commands it as a king. And we can see from this, no one is fooling this king of kings and lord of lords. He looks into your heart and he looks into mine. And he measures what you're doing with that command, not by the amount you give, but by what it costs you. Because that was how he, how, he, how he valued the, wom- the widow's offering. Do you notice? Not by the amount that she gave. It seemed very small, actually. But by what it cost her. What was left. And before you protest and say, it's not fair. Jesus is intruding on my life like this with all his authority. Stamping his authority and saying, do this. Ask yourself, please ask yourself, is he a good king? Is he a good king? Is he really spoiling your fun? When he talks to you like this, I mean, who here wouldn't want to be like the widow? Is he really spoiling your fun? Who wouldn't want to be like the widow? Which is where we finish. You see, the tables have been turned today. Jesus is the one who's asking the questions today. And all that matters as we close is the question that he has for each one of us. Do you recognize this king's authority? And what do you want him to do for you? Do you really want him to give you a heart like that widow? That's almost the most important question as we finish today. Do you really want him to give you a heart like this widow? Don't rush on because you've got to answer that question yourself in thinking about this now. Do you really, really want him to give you a heart like this widow are you desperate for your heart not to fall effortlessly as an enemy of the king we saw before her and so will you pray lord jesus don't give me over to my heart which is naturally bent on earthly things lord give me a heart like this widow He wants that more than you can imagine, but you have to ask him for it. Do it now. Do it for the first time or do it for the umpteenth time, but don't go away from the question that he's asking and don't do it. He's asking, do you want a heart like this widow? And then ask him to make your heart change so real that you will, like this widow, you will give and give and give. And maybe in our lives we might get something close to her, somewhere close to her as the Lord does his impossible work in our hearts. Ask him to change your heart so that we will give and give and give. Money, uh, yeah, of course, time, um, our gifts, our lives, all that we are, to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and love our neighbor of ourselves, even even out of our poverty. We might get somewhere close to this, this wonderful widow. Let's bow our heads.
our Lord Jesus, you step out of these Gospels, and in particular this incident here, as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you are the one who is ruling and reigning right now in this moment at the right hand of your Father. And you've given us a window into the reality of the things that are happening in this room and beyond us, across your world, across all of history. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, for having such a small concept of you. And with the weather dry and the grass dry outside, Lord, we think about wanting to be soaked and saturated our lives with the reality of your kingly rule. Lord, please would you do that? Would you help us to delight in your commands? And may your lordship banish our fears and our anxieties and free us to love others and give wholeheartedly, love you and to love our neighbours. Lord, some of us are pausing here this morning and we are saying, please, would you give us a heart of this widow? We're asking you for it, Lord. Please give us the heart of this widow. Do the impossible in us. For some of it, yes, it might be do that for the first time. For some of it, do that again. You've, you've done something impossible. Now, now finish the work that you've begun in us. And maybe for some of us, it's just a prayer. Lord, uh, help me to want to want to have a heart of this widow. Lord, would you answer that prayer if that's somebody's prayer? Wherever we're at, Lord, uh, please meet us and with, uh, with this your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to finish with a